I and mean, it's been really um, cool to see how our ties to education have really been strengthened by Moosin's appointment there. Um, he also directs student engagement with our Inspire Research Institute. And his research focuses on designing, evaluating, and improving student-centered ped pedagogical approaches that enhance student learning and engagement. And I'll tell you a little bit more about kind of what that means. So he designs in vivo studies on core learning science principles to understand the mechanisms that explain the effectiveness and limitations of active learning methods. And that means he, he not only determines if instructional approaches are effective, but he's looking at uh, sort of advancing fundamental knowledge into why active learning works or doesn't work and exactly what students are learning. And so to give you an example, he developed a framework called the ICAP framework with that has basically changed the definition of how we think about um, active learning in STEM education. And so that um, is really about kind of um, emphasizing the importance of interactive learning and offering clear and practical guidance to instructors about how they can improve active learning. Professor Maneksha has been extremely successful in securing funding, including a PI role on a $1.4 million grant from the Institute of Education Sciences, which is a highly competitive research arm in the U.S. Department of Education. And it was highly unusual to get this award as a uh, pre-tenure faculty member. And that project brings together two and four-year institutions to integrate mobile learning technologies with natural language processing as a means to enhance undergrad STEM education. And most recently, he's part of a $2.8 million collaboration with colleagues in ECE and physics um, on a, it's a DOD funded project to develop a quantum learning education program. And I think we might learn more about that today. Um, he received the Wickenden Award, which in our field is, um, it's an award given for the best article published in our flagship journal, the Journal of Engineering Education. Um, his articles are, are often on the list of most cited for that journal. So that uh, speaks a bit to the impact of his work on our field. He's initiated and led course improvements in our first year engineering program, and he's co-developed and taught graduate courses as part of the integrated STEM certificate on campus. And he recently received our um, engineering education excellence in undergrad teaching award. So that's a little bit about Musin, and I will, I will turn it over to him. All right, thank you so much, uh, Donna, and thank you so much, Ian Mang, for this event and introducing me also. I'm grateful for my colleagues, uh, for my uh, students, for my, uh, all the support system I'm receiving at Purdue. So today I have only 10 minutes, so I will be very brief on different parts. I choose the lifelong learning as the, the topic of my, uh, the title of my talk, which actually captures uh, the main parts of what I do professionally. So my research is on learning. So it's either science learning or engineering learning at different age groups, Sometimes I'm working with middle school students, sometimes high school students, sometimes undergrad students, also informal learning environments, for example, the robotics tournaments, uh, how students are learning those uh, like uh, non-cognitive skills as well, like how they are collaborating. So this is capturing also as a faculty member, as a lifelong learning, you know, uh, each month, each semester, I feel like I'm learning something new from my colleagues, from my students. If, when I review a proposal, I'm learning from that proposal. When I review a journal article, I'm learning from my colleagues from that journal article. Uh, when I teach something, I'm learning new things about that concept. Uh, when I go to a talk, I'm learning from other faculty members or other students. So lifelong learning is actually perfectly capturing uh, what I do. Uh, before I will go uh, talking about you know, my a few projects, I would like to uh, do some acknowledgements. As the acknowledgements, uh, I wanted to, you know, start with my family. Uh, like since my childhood, I had a huge support uh, from my family members, from my parents, my sister, uh, and my cousins also, my aunts, uncles. I have a very large family. I have 27 cousins and all of them living in Turkey. So in any city in Turkey, I have family members and that's a great luxury. And also my wife, my kids, which uh, have been supporting me every single day, every single moment. So this is the first acknowledgement. Uh, my students, uh, I had a chance to work with excellent students, both at the University of Pittsburgh 
and the Purdue University, uh, both undergrad students and graduate students. So they helped me a lot. I learned from them a lot. Without them, there was no research projects and they are still helping me on a daily basis. My advisors and mentors, uh, Dr. Mickey Chi, Dr. Doug Clark, and my mentors at Purdue, Shanai Perzer, Robin Adams, and Brenda Copabianco, these are all people helping me uh, in my professional journey. My colleagues and collaborators, uh, either in grant projects or in articles or different projects. So these are also uh, uh, my friends, not just colleagues and collaborators, but uh, helping me at various projects at various parts of uh, my professional life. Okay, so uh, after the acknowledgements, I would like to just briefly say my research interests. So I can group them under three categories. First one is students' understanding of complex topics, uh, heavily on engineering and science concepts across different age groups. The other one is my research is on small group learning, uh, how students collaborate in small groups, verbal interactions, how it is related to student success. And the last one is metacognition and its implications for learning. Uh, uh, this is a uh, part of the course mirror technology project. And today I will be talking about two of my projects. One is this course mirror technology and the other one is our new project uh, with my colleagues from EC and physics. So uh, the first project I will be talking is the course mirror project. So this is, uh, I started this project in 2014 and since then I have been working on this project. So the main question uh, on the course mirror project is how can we modify the passive natures of large lectures while actively involving students in the learning process. So we all know, especially in the freshman and sophomore years, there are a lot of large lecture courses and the uh, interaction is naturally is very limited because of the ratio of the student to uh, the faculty ratio. So the question was, how can we make some changes? How can we change this, the passive nature? So, we have been using the student reflection uh, as a strategy, prompting students to reflect on their learning experiences. So that's the, the main strategy uh, of the project. So as I said, this is the main question. And to prompt students, we developed a mobile application called Course Mirror that's prompting students to reflect on their learning experiences after each class throughout the semester. Also, we are generating summaries of these reflections by using natural language process. So the idea is, you know, in a very large lecture, it may not be feasible for an instructor to read, go through all the reflections and that creating the summary can be providing a better uh, snapshot of what's going on in their class. You can think this like a comments in your course evaluation, but on a regular basis and focusing on the content, like questions, the reflection questions we are asking, like what you found most confusing in today's class or what you found most interesting in today's class. So the uh, NLP algorithms providing summaries by clustering these reflections. And then we are making these summaries available to both instructors and students. So instructors can see what's going on, what's the feedback from their students. And students can also see what's going on in this class because they only see their own individual reflections, but maybe there are other things their peers are finding confusing or interesting. So like this is the, the standard version. This is the old version actually that we created in 2014. This is most straightforward, you know, you can look at in the first one, there's a course, let's say this is an engineering course, the list of the lectures, this is what students see basically. Then there is the, if they click on, let's say lecture 10, today's class, there's a reflection prompt, describe what was confusing or needed more detail. They provide a reflection. And let's say there are 100 students in this class. We have 100 of these responses. And then we create a summary of these, you know, these bulleted points. These are the main things your students are telling about this class. So now uh, we are working on, and we created the adaptive version of this technology. The adaptive version is monitoring the reflection quality in real time and scaffolding the reflection writing process. Why we needed this? Because uh, based on our uh, prior implementations, what we found is students are writing sometimes like none, nothing, or just leaving it blank, right? But this is not helpful, this is not useful, like this is not a valuable data or not a valuable activity for students also. They are not thinking about their experience in that class. So now what's happening is we are providing prompts like this, you know, please think carefully, a good reflection needs to be more specific. Basically we are pushing them a little bit to write something more specific. 
let's say the example is something like that. And you can see also color bar is changing. So it's getting from red to green. You will see the whole lecture was confusing. Okay, but this is still not helpful, you know. So we are still pushing students. Let's say, you know, some prompts like this. Could you please tell us more details? Okay, so let's say students now write something like this. The concept of affordance was confusing. At least we know they are referring a, a certain concept from the class days, concept of affordance. Okay, maybe if you push further, what happens? You know, there's a sweet balance here, but I'm not talking in the details. Uh, let's say at the end, in the ideal case, now students are telling us the difference between hidden and false affordance terms was confusing. So from none to here is... Uh, you know, more valuable. This is providing more feedback to instructor. Also, it is helping students to monitor their understanding. So that's the, the adaptive version of the course mirror technology. So we have this model, reflection, informed learning and instruction. You know, we are using student reflection and instructor feedback. And this is going on throughout the semester, not like one time thing. And the, the hypothesis is if we can create this model, this reflection, informed learning and instruction, we can see student learning uh, improving, student engagement is improving. Also from the instructor side, you know, they, ha they have a, a better uh, uh, teaching materials. Okay, I'm not going into details here. The, you know, there are a lot of details here, but I only have like a few minutes now. Uh, but that's the model. And uh, some preliminary research findings from our previous studies, students are actually willing to submit reflections in a timely manner. So most students, it, when it's coming from their instructors, if the instructor is telling, please submit your reflections, students typically submit reflections. So uh, another finding we have reflection summaries are allowing instructors to understand students' difficulties efficiently. Uh, another finding we have is the students enjoy reading the summaries. Uh, the reflection quality is improving over time in a semester, so students writing something more specific over time. Also, we have the automated and human-generated summaries, and we are comparing them because there's a line of research on the NLP, uh, so if it is comparative or not. So, like, these are the research questions we are focusing on. I'm not going all the details, but since 2014, we have been focusing on different parts of these research questions, and we are still working on this project, collecting data in real time, in real classrooms uh, at different institutions. And um, yeah, that, that, that's the, the course mirror project. And the next project, which I'm going to be very brief, uh, this is a very new grant we just received this semester. Uh, it is the innovation in uh, quantum application and installation to culture IQ Park project uh, from the Department of Defense. My colleagues from ECE, Mehdi Husseini, and from physics, Erika Carlson and me received this. And actually, uh, we had an internal grant before this from the nano and quantum. So thanks to College of Engineering for that opportunity, we built on that grant. So Mehdi and I came together with an internal grant with 75K. So from 75K to $3 million, I think that's a good investment for the College of Engineering. And I'm grateful to be part of such a, a smart people act. It's a smart program. And I hope that continues uh, uh, these internal grants. And basically, this project is there are different parts. Uh, there are quantum machines, quantum education, quantum outreach, and some quantum related jobs, internship opportunities in quantum industry. Uh, we just started. Uh, I believe I will be busy with this project uh, for the next four years. Uh, I hope to present results and papers uh, in uh, different meetings, uh, and I'm not going details here. Also, these are the project goals. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this talk as well. Um, any questions? I have a question, which is, do you have tips for folks with joint appointments? How was that balancing that as, as a pre-tenure person? So there are advantages and disadvantages, definitely being a joint appointment. Advantages are, um, like there are different, like let's say that internal grant competition. I can see from College of Engineering, also from College of Education. Like that's an opportunity that I can submit uh, in different programs. Another uh, opportunity is I can supervise students from different colleges. Uh, I can uh, naturally meet with other faculty and collaborate and write grants with people from different faculty. I think the challenges are, uh, uh, like the, the volume of the emails that you are receiving all the emails from two colleges, which is fine. 
but sometimes the colleges are feeling that you don't have the joint appointment and expecting you to attend every single event. Uh, sometimes overlaps these things. So those parts are, uh, I think, difficult. And my in my case, it was 75, 25. So it was more clear cut that I know my home department is the uh, College of Engineering and the School of Engineering Education. But if it is 50-50, I think it can be more challenging, uh, especially if there are, you know, these uh, some conflicts between department heads or the faculty members. That can be an issue, I believe, if it is the 50-50. But I think 75-25 model is uh, much better. I think someone in the chat, yeah. Mm -hmm. a question. Yeah, Dr. Babs would like to ask, what is quantum pedagogy? Oh, what is quantum pedagogy? So like not the quantum pedagogy, but what we are trying to do in that project, I can tell. Um, so my bachelor's and master's in physics and typically quantum courses came at very late, you know, either in your four year or in the grad school level. So most students, most engineers also graduate, most scientists also graduate with not taking any single quantum course uh, and, you know, um, that's still the reality in most professions. So what we are trying to do that in projects, we are trying to identify some concepts, some quantum concepts, uh, for example, quantum key cryptogra cryptography, sorry, I can't say, uh, some concepts and try to integrate in at an early age, at the undergraduate level, at the high school level, for example, if, if there is a way to integrate some of the quantum concepts in the, uh, the optics lessons in physics, in some uh, courses in periodic table at an earlier age, how can we integrate, introduce some of these concepts at an earlier age? So the, the project is starting taking these concepts at the grad level and simplify it definitely and integrate into existing lessons uh, at an earlier age. That's the main goal uh, for that project. It's time with the mic, Greg Shaver, Mechanical Engineering. Great talk, very exciting uh, what you've done and where you're going. So tell me, why do that? Why pull the quantum stuff earlier? Oh, uh, the one thing is uh, with the, the quantum is becoming, you know, previously quantum was not, um, it was just uh, staying in the circles of science and engineering, but it's coming more uh, commercialized. So more industry demand right now. So you can see the companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Google are making investments. And uh, because Department of Defense is funding this, this is a strategic area for them as well. So it is a strategic area because of the workforce development actually. So if you can introduce and inspire some people at an earlier age, there's a higher chance that these people may have careers in the quantum related fields, which will be addressing the, the workforce gap uh, in the society and in the industry. That's the, 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 the main idea, but it is not now. I think it's like decades still, you know, there's not like an undergrad degree. There are undergrad courses, for example, and they are developing newly, but there are still very few actually. Should we thank Musa? Thank you so much.